Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. I'm Alan Peoples with Patricia Awion Lehman. This is our 32nd episode, Kundalini in Motion. Tell us about it. <laughs> where do I begin? Um, <laughs> we're looking at it. We're going to talk about the slides that uh, the pictures that you're looking at now, um, because this is this is the story of our duality. Um, we don't exist in this world. We don't have life. There is no breath without duality. Um, and that's something, you know, we all know this. We, we were taught this in physics, but it's expressed in so many beautiful ways in Egypt. And within this presentation and the next, we want, you know, we, we introduced some really interesting concepts like, you know, guess what, folks, at some point, <laughs> Uh, the magnetics are going to flip and everything's going to spin the other direction. And so we I, we want to introduce more uh, information to show you how this, you know, how this was presented, how this was understood and how, you know, it, it's understood everywhere. They can't be any other way. And it's 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 not if you think in terms of physical bodies, you're never going to understand how it actually happens because the we, as we presented many times we are held hostage by the belief that we're physical bodies that we exist in a material world um everything we think is real isn't and this is what the ancients were trying to tell us because this is that moment in time when everything begins to shift and change we can feel it we know something's happening and it is and it's mind blowing. But if we remember we're not our bodies and we begin to understand how we begin to rise, how can we keep going in the same direction we're going, which is down, folks? No, just kidding. <laughs> how can we keep going in the same direction and rise? Um, there has to be, you know, uh, Osiris. I mean, Harris says Osiris turn over and rise. And that's what we want to talk about. This is how Kundalini works. There's two serpents involved in Kundalini energy. And everything that we discuss happening without, which is the illusion, is happening within. And that's what the indigenous communities worldwide are telling us we need to go within. So let's get started. And of course, what you're talking about is electromagnetism. Oh, of course. That's liquid light, light becoming form. An, an illusion of form and it's electromagnet um uh magnetic it, it, it and it, it literally can't it, it, it can't be any other way we exist as taurus fields within taurus fields within taurus fields in a fractal holographic um <laughs> almost virtual reality you know there's so many theories about even that um, but I think it's not so much, you know, that we're locked in a, a computer-based matrix other than we're in this, you know, this grand architect, Sachet, created this incredible matrix of energy that allows us to play. Or as I have on this slide, we get to do the dance of duality um, that separates, not heave, heaven, <laughs> sorry about that, that separates heaven and earth. Um, these figures uh, I saw at um, the Anatolian Civilization Museum in Turkey a couple of years ago, and I was so drawn to them. And the um, card that was with this particular display said they were winged griffin demons holding up the heavens. But to me, it's something, you know, far more, you know, look at them. They're facing each other. This is the duality that allows this separation of heaven and earth. So we get to dance on the game board of life. I almost I see a this. skull. Also, if you if you go one one slide back, uh -huh. maybe I'm seeing things, but I almost see a skull in the negative space between those two figures. Well, yeah, maybe. But of course, our bones are a physical representation of our magnetic field. Well, of course, of course, and and our bodies, as presented, are perfections of the patterning of nature cycles. That's why, you know, when I talk about the two ladies being Kundalini, it's happening within us. It's happening on the earth with our magnetic grid lines. And we've talked about the ancient magnetic equator. And well, of course, we're gonna talk about it again because it's all playing this dance of life. Understand the patterns, feel the patterns, then you know how to navigate and harness them to make this 
a beautiful journey. It doesn't have to be as painful as we sometimes make it. Right. We've said that before. Instead of fighting against it, if you learn how to harness it, it, it works to your benefit every time. It's not necessarily going with the flow. It's sometimes knowing how to funnel the flow mm -hmm. in all the right directions. Um, so, and I saw this, and it, to me, it's that dance of alchemy. It's, it's the sun and the moon. Um, and I love how the sun is playing music, right? Harmony, it's like the sistrum, bringing order to the universe by cajoling the moon. Um, because it is the coming together of day and night, um, light and dark, masculine and feminine, that brings us into unity consciousness, which is complete knowing. Um, so <laughs> here we go. I'm going to jump right in and we're going to talk about these two ladies, um, which are known to be Wajit and Nekvet. Um, and on the far right, I have an image. Um, it's of Mut. And you see on her crown, at the very bottom, you can see there's a vulture and a serpent. The serpent is Wajit. The vulture is Nekvet. Wajit represents, she, these are the two ladies. Um, uh, that's what they're known as in ancient Egypt. And Wajit um, is the cobra, and he represents, she represents the lady of lower Egypt, and Nekbet as the vulture represents the lady of southern Egypt. So again, the two hemispheres of the earth and of the brain, um, and of the kundalini rising. So the kundalini goes both directions, and this is important to understand. Um, so you, there's a descent and an ascent, ascent of this energy and motion that brings us back into unity. And it's the same thing as the ascending and descending consciousness. We have to experience both directions, both consciousness devolving and consciousness ascending in order to know how to transmute polarity and come back to our center. And there at the very top, you see with, with um, I believe it is Moot herself as the vulture because she's also represented as the vulture and she has wrapped her wings around both Nekbet and um, Wajit as these two serpents, which they're often portrayed as. Um, and of course, on the far, in the little upper corner in the right, you see the two um, staffs that Toth or Jehudi holds. We'll see them again in this presentation. And Underneath each serpent, we see the lotus and the papyrus, and they also represent upper and lower Egypt. So we're looking at a dynamic that if when you're walking through Egypt through these amazing temples, you'll see this dynamic played out with just the lotus and the papyrus or just the, 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 the crowns, the red and the white crowns. But it's always the same dynamic. And I want to point out these things because when you come to Egypt or when you're studying Egypt, it's wonderful to understand the symbolism as it's di displayed, not each temple separately with a different story, but the same story in all of the temples with different archetypal, archetypal foundations. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's just an amazing, beautiful book <laughs> that, you know, uh, uh, patterns, energies woven together to show us the patterning of life itself. Um, and of course, the image on the far left is Heka, and he's he's harnessing, he's magic. He is he is the one that knows how to feel, harness, and navigate the energies. And he's brought those two dual opposing currents; they're facing different directions into unity by creating the X. He's brought them together and created a portal between heaven and earth. And that must be the origin of our word hex, meaning a, a spell or magic. Exactly. Of course. X, X, H. Heaven and earth is, is the divine H, right? It's hydrogen that separates heaven and earth on a, on a biochemical level. Um, and then the X, there's your portal. Um, Hattor is that uh, portal. Between well, and that's just another example of the inversion of language, perhaps, like the word whore, H-O-R, has come to have a negative con connotation. Hex oh. is really a negative spell, if you think about it. Absolutely. And of course, Hattor, the whore, what is a whore considered today, right? So they've taken something beautiful as a portal and turned it into something negative. Exactly. From 
some people's perspectives. Mm. So again, we're not here to judge anything. We're just offering information, but it's fascinating how, you know, we take something that's just dual opposing weight spin, which can't be good or bad, and men create the, the judgments of good and evil, you know, and, and, and in reality, nothing's really good or evil <laughs> unless you bring it here down to earth. Um, in an upcoming presentation, I'm going to share something I just read that is absolutely beautiful. And, you know, it basically says that, you know, everything we could say anything is real or not real and we'd be right because it can exist if we believe it exists. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, just so many things to bring forward to think about as we go through our everyday lives, um, because, again, every choice we make brings us either closer to unity consciousness or further away. Um, and I think now, you know, the reason Alan and I are working so hard to bring these presentations to you at this moment in time, because we it takes up a lot of our time to create and come together and make this happen, um, is because it is this moment in time that is so important. Um, and we feel the sense of urgency to need to bring forward the knowledge. Absolutely. And for it to be free. <laughs> and for it to be free. Absolutely. So thank you. And thank you, Alan, for your contribution in all this. That's it's it's, it's it's a lot. And we have so much more. Um, hopefully you'll stick with us. I love doing it. And like I said before we started recording, I have the privilege of seeing this before anyone. So. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, you've been in the temples with me. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, I keep this more and more of this information keeps coming through to me. And I think it's all in the right timing. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody's talking about how their dreams are getting more and more intense. And that's happening to me. And it's also bringing forward a lot of what I'm showing in these presentations. It's just coming to me. Um, and so I, I've got to believe that it's, it's meant to come out, not with this is fact, but with this is, you know, these are possibilities. Um, and you decide, um, again, which way you want to spin. <laughs> um, so it was written that all, all tremble when Ra's Ba comes into being, right? And his being is the magic that has power over the Neteru. Um, power over the Neteru. So his Ba, right, is magic. But Ra also claims in other texts that magic is my Ka. So in a way, we're talking about the Ka and Ba as also being these dual opposing wave spins. You know, this is the life force and the spirit. It, you know, everything is is involved in this process. Um, so to understand that, ka, life force, ba, spirit. Um, I've heard Dr. Ibrahim Karim talk about how, how we have these two voices. I'll, I'll use the word voices within us that are constantly battling with each other. And you can almost sense that as being your life force, right? That, that which keeps us alive, and then your ba, your spirit, which, which wants to return to center, you know? And again, it's transmuting those two energies that are both good and, and bringing that into some for to, form of unity um, consciousness. Uh, so <laughs> literally to me, this is all fascinating. I hope it is to you as well. So our journey of perception begins as a dance between these dual opposing forces of nature, which manifest in everything, you know? And, and so when I talk about the hemispheres of the brain, I'm also talking about the hemispheres of the earth. This is the game board um, and the game board, you know, <laughs> it's not just understanding that we're moving from right to left brain consciousness, but also understanding that movement is happening on the game board itself. So how we navigate it makes a, you know, it, it makes a big difference. Um, and learning how to harness it makes an even bigger difference, especially within. So here we have the two, I'm showing you here how this can manifest the, 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 this beautiful cobra uh, wajit that separates the two hemispheres of the brain is also the magnetic equator that separates the two hemispheres of the earth when at Zeptepi, when that first breath occurred. And then as we devolve, that, that beautiful energy begins to separate. Um, 
and uh, the magnetic equator starts to get a little chaotic. And uh, we've talked about this. We've done the whole presentations on this. I like to keep every, everything fresh in your mind as we go forward because it's such a huge body of information. So we'll go quickly through it. If, you're, if, you, if you don't remember what we're, we're talking about, you can go back to that particular presentation because they're all available on, uh, on uh, the uh, YouTube Horace Rising Productions site. So I love this when I saw it. Um, and it says, the true alchemist does not change lead into gold. He changes ignorance. It, say that 10 times fast. He changes <laughs> ignorance into knowledge, doubt into certainty, and fear into love. I like that. Because fear is that which keeps us held hostage. I, you know, I, I've said that a thousand times, um, at least in, in these presentations. Um, and from Carl Jung in Symbols of Transformation, he says, the spirit of evil is negation of the life force from fear. This is what happens. That's, that's how evil manifests through fear. Mm. Only boldness can deliver from fear. <laughs> I like that. And if the risk is not taken, the meaning of life is somehow violated. So there's a reason not to go with the flow because the way things are flowing now, um, it's almost like we're being encouraged to be in a state of fear at all times. Um, and we're also going to do a presentation on the Hanuti and how that all came to be. The Hanuti being the entities that, you know, come forward with agendas that create fear because it offers them control. Um, and do you want to give your power over to something outside of yourself the ancients encouraged us to go within to find the power of a heart-centered consciousness mm -hmm. and there's draco we've we've shown him before but it's so important when we're talking about these things to realize that this is not only happening on earth but in the heavens above and the in the heavens above these, that circumpolar star and the spin and the motion and the movement is our clock to tell us where we're at in our great ear. What's happening? You know, it, you know it, where is the Big Dipper? It's telling us where the pole star is, what state of consciousness we're in. Again, it's a map. It's a symbolic map to tell us where we are. And, you know, I, I would always say, yeah, yeah, we can wait for, for everything to come together in 24 for the 26,000 year cycle, or we can make it happen in any breath, intake and outtake of breath. Um, but uh, Harpocrates was the god of silence. When I say Harpocrates, that becomes the Roman name for Horus, of course. <laughs> the, the names keep changing because we consciousness is migrating, um, as, <laughs> as were the occupants of Egypt. Um, but uh, he was the god of silence, okay, that moment of silence. So he's harnessing the dual opposing, um, basically, you know, the polarity within himself, the dual opposing wave spin within himself. He's, he's um, not killing the beasts, but he's transmuting the beasts within. So he creates that moment of silence in the Hellenistic religion adapted by the Greeks from the god Horus. The tongue of Bess representing our ecliptic pole or place where the Earth's axis would point to if it were brought back into balance from its 23.5 degree fall, and we've talked about this, mm -hmm. is blend, bend, blending here with the cobra emerging from the third eye of Taurus. Take a look at that. See where Bess is? Now, we've talked about him being in the ecliptic pole, as I just said, the eye, the eye nebula, right? Uh, the um, cat's eye nebula in the one of the coils of Draco, and you can see where his tongue always is. It's the cobra. He's taking, he's offering the next breath of life. Isn't that wild? Coming out of the forehead of of the head shot. Well, basically, yes, because that's where the it, you know that's the Kundalini has risen. The cobra is coming out of the third eye. It actually retreats, goes down again, and then zooms out of the head chakra. Um, and then spit out by best for the next round. Um, <laughs> seemingly, because um, people have asked me about this. 
So this outstretched tongue represents the next breath or stage because people ask me, why is Bess's tongue sticking out? You know, and some people say, well, you know, that shows you're dead. <laughs> or it can mean, you know, boom, the mouth is open and the next, you know, the, the next word coming out, the next sound, the next breath is the next breath of life. Right. Um, only moments of silence. Um, so when our polarity is transmuted, the jet pillar is raised and then boom, we, we come back out again. The resurrection and then Horus becomes the ascended Osiris. So in other words, on an inner level, after our Kundalini rises and emerges out of our pineal and then dips back to the root chakra, it surges again, explodes out of the head. I just said this, <laughs> entering into the higher, higher realms. This is the next breath after the resolution of our inner angels and demons represented in the East as the churning of milk. The end product of this churning back and forth between yin and yang is the elixir of immortality. And this occurs on multiple levels. Horus was originally called Hiru and in ancient Egypt was the hero on the hero's journey of Osiris who travels the yin yang path of duality in an effort to find inner balance and peace. See, we're done. I've said it all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've said it before, but it, it does bear repeating um, because it is so huge. Uh, it, it literally is the journey that we're all on. Um, and, <laughs> and so here is just a, an easier way of seeing this. A little, it, It's a little bigger. Um, you can see the cobra, um, and sometimes we see it make that sine wave path or, uh, on the um, uh, atop the uh, on top of the head, the yin yang path. Mm -hmm. I also found what's interesting is the figures um, right where Bess's head is, walking away from center. On the on the one side, we have Ptah, Sekhmet, and Nefertum. That's the left hand side, right? Um, at, well, the right brain, left hand, um, and then Amon, Mut, and Kansu would be the other side, the right hand side, or the left brain understanding, and they are moving out from center into the next breath at the top. Huh. Isn't that interesting? So Amun, when this all occurs, there, that's the triad that is the, um, Amun is when we dip into the night cycle, into left brain consciousness. And of course, Bata, Sekhmet, and Nefertum. Sekhmet is the one that scourges the earth, creates, you know, gets drunk and passes out for three days, sees Bata, and gives birth to Nefertum, which is the harmony of the atom. Mm -hmm. Um, and with the other side, we actually have that moment of Atum being, uh, giving birth to the sine wave pattern and Atum is the atom, is the atom. So it's showing you the two different spins. So um, we're finishing the Amun spin <laughs> and we're going to experience the Sekhmet, Bata, Nefertum right, dynamic. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And Draco's reflection on Earth, we've talked about this before with the dragons and the serpents, the lions and tigers on my <laughs> presentation. Yeah. Um, but Draco's reflection is the path of the magnetic equator on Earth, as above, so below. Um, and it's become chaotic. And this is why Set or Horus has to kill the beast. Later in Christianity, it becomes St. George or many different figures killing the beast. Um, however, the beast isn't necessarily evil. It's actually chaos. What's happened with the magnetic equator? It's, it's gone chaotic. It's crazy. Um, and uh, we've talked about the story of Tefnut where it goes south and it's now in Nubia, which is... Um, Ethiopia, that particular area, and it's not one beautiful line across. You're looking at it now, but if you look at it closely, it, it'll be all these different currents, all separated and, and chaotic going across the earth, wreaking havoc. Um, and that's the chaos that ends when we go back to center. Make sense? Yes. Cool. <laughs> if it makes sense to you, Alan, I'm good. Well, 
I just had this image in my head of a tuning fork for some reason. Like when you hit it initially, there's a moment of chaos before it reaches its resonance exactly. that it's meant to have. Exactly. Yes. And everything comes back to center. That's the beauty of sound. And that, you know, it's good that you brought that up because it's very similar to the sistrum. When you walk through Dendera, you know, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, you see uh, many figures, including Haras, shaking the sistrum. And it's to restore the silence, the calmness, the peace on earth to Hathor, who again is, is moving into that field of chaos. So restoring peace through sound resonance with sound system and Manit necklace. Um, so here we have again this, this dual opposing magnetic flow up and down and up and down, inhalation, exhalation. It's, it's what um, is called here the cosmic pendulum. Mm -hmm. um, but in the center, we have that wonderful moment of silence. And you, you can see where in the spiral, because it's a spiraling motion, you know, we want to view it as something that's happening in a linear fashion, but it's not. It's always spiraling in and out and in and out. And it's the spiraling that, that gives us this perception of time and space. Um, and it's electromagnetic, of course. So that center is when we hit center, that is our moment of, of complete unity, consciousness, gnosis, silence. Um, and it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it's, it's Mott's, it, 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 it's all about, you know, this energy of Ma'at keeping everything in balance. Um, and this happens again, like we've talked about with the chakras as, as well. People want to believe that, you know, we, we balance each chakra separately, but my feeling is it, it doesn't work that way because when we come to silence, all of the seven come together actually in the heart. This is where it all ends until the next breath. Oh, right, because that's the very center of your Taurus field. Well, exactly. Everything is centered in the heart. All labyrinths are centered. That, that's where the Holy Grail is. And I, I'm going to talk about that. You know, it's not the head chakra. It's not up here in the pineal. The, the Holy Grail, I mean, there is a portal in the pineal gland. Um, <laughs> however, the Holy Grail is always the heart of all the labyrinths. Um, and this is, this is wonderful. I just want to show, you know, here we see this wonderful figure of a Buddha sitting on Draco, right? In the center. <laughs> and, um, you can see above him is this, the seven headed, um, serpent that we're so familiar with. And it's got the face of Beth, Beth in the center. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh yeah. And of course, you know, I have the red circle around the crown of Bess at the bottom in the center because it has all those serpents coming out. Um, it's that same understanding. And then there's Medusa. Boy, she looks like Bess, doesn't she? Uh, yes. <laughs> she <is. laughs> um, and of course, all the serpents. And we all know she, her hair is made of serpents. So it's the same dynamic told in different kinds of stories, having the same base, basic understanding and message. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, do, how does Perseus beat Medusa, but by showing her the mirror, it's reversal. <laughs> when she sees her reversed image, you know, that's it. <laughs> right, we, we talked about this uh, two episodes ago. Yes, we did. So here we have this wonderful image of Bess. I took this picture at Philae. Um, there's a temple to Hattor there, and it's the temple that celebrates the return of the wandering eye, which is Tefnut or Sekhmet. It's that same understanding of now the water, the, the unity consciousness is returning. And here we have this image of, of Bess. And if you look at the how they depict his ears and his eyebrows, it's actually, they're making two figure eights on either side and it's showing how everything reverses direction. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> through sound, right? Through sound. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can almost see two sideways Taurus fields spinning away out, out of the side of his head. Thank you, exactly. 
I, I, and, and if you look at the very top corners, there are the two eyes. <laughs> and, and the curls of his beard even indicate the direction of the spin. Exactly. You know, and these are the things that I have been spotting my whole, ever since I've come to Egypt, is these patterns that are all telling <laughs> the same story. So I'm so happy I get to share these things. And he's got the lion on his chest also. Exactly. <laughs> Reg Regulus, is that it? <laughs> uh, let me go back. Uh, previous. Oh, the lion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he wears the the lion skin or the leopard skin because he's also related to first breath, like Seshet, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we're all just Sesh, it, it, that, at the time of unity consciousness, you know, and, and that first breath, we all come out as um, as being liquid light, becoming form and feeling and and being able to master currency we're all masters of currency and you get to wear the the lion leopard um feline skin if you're a master of currency mm -hmm. and so, not just in egypt but also to the aztecs to cultures all over the world who wore these feline skins in the world you're absolutely right it, it, and again mind-blowing you know it, it's it, you know, it can be a panther or a jaguar or a puma in South America, but it's still the same understanding. Mm -hmm. It's feline energy. Um, and again, they, they cats, felines, lions enjoy geopathic stress zones, zones where there's, you know, this <laughs> radiation emerging out of the earth. Mm -hmm. So it represents current, the currency of earth, which is, cre you know, the, the, the patterns created by the energy of the solar wind and the galactic radiation from the heavens above. Um, and, and another reason, and I, again, I'm going to talk about this a lot as we continue into more presentations, but a lot of what we're feeling today, the chaos, the anger, the frustration, you know, disease, meaning we're not at ease. All of this is occurring because that solar radiation and galactic radiation is pumped up and our, you know, there's the, <laughs> there's a breath from the center of the galaxy, a field of dust that's, you know, entering our, you know, our solar system and our magnetic field is weakening exponentially, you know, and understanding why you feel frustrated or angry or anxious helps you to bring yourself back into resonance. You know, to use music, to use the tools you have at your disposal to bring your, bring yourself back into cal calmness instead of what I've, I've recognized in myself. There are times I feel anxious and I start blaming things outside of myself. However, you know, they, they, I, I'm creating, I'm imagining something that doesn't exist because I don't understand my emotions. So understanding makes a huge difference. So here we have it again. <laughs> I'm actually going to use this again, uh, either in this presentation or the next. But on the far left, you see, you know, all is one current again, but you see the duality. You know, you have the serpent head with the, the, the beard representing the masculine, and then you have the feminine on the, um, the other side, two sides on either side of the scarab, which is at the sun, and almost it's an atten form when it's at noon mm -hmm. and then the currency begins to shift um and what's cool is you know when you if you look there's two left eyes there because the feminine serpent is facing of course the feminine direction um and we see the two ladies in front of the eyes and that's again neck bet and wajit um and this is that is the pattern back to unity consciousness Two sides of the same coin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even Buddha had another side. <laughs> Who knew? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, unity consciousness in Egypt is represented by this netter on the far left. Which oh my is, God, this one is, this one's wild. It, it, <laughs> it's incredible. But he is an aspect, he's, he's best in unification, you know, before that first breath. And it's like a little bit of everything. Everything, exactly. 
Um, and, and here he's called Lord to the limit. The creator God, never chair, was probably an alter ego of Atum. He's, he's an alter ego. I've heard him call Harris, Fess. He's all, you know, he's at one time he was considered female. And of course, in the very beginning, he was the great he, she. He is all, everything that is, was, or ever shall be. Um, and look at the two in the figure on, the, on the, the image of him. You see there's two lions sort of at the top of the feathers, and they're both spitting out in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. um, but um, at any rate, who, he, he, an alter ego of Atum, who is described in the coffin texts as being never chair and pet, lord to the limits of the sky. Uh, he's thought to be an abbreviation of this name, and thus, whilst, whilst it literally meant Lord to the Limit, it may also be translated as Lord of All or Lord of the Universe. There you have it, <laughs> the great, you know, center of all, you know, the cat's eye nebula. Mm -hmm. uh, the myth of the creation by Neverger is preserved in the Bremner Rhine Papyrus, which was composed in the Ptolemaic period, around 310 B.C., though the original date may be to the New Kingdom, while, which probably makes a whole lot of sense. While drawing on the Old Kingdom myth of Atum, masturbating and ejaculating Shu and Tefnu, and the Middle Kingdom myth of Atum, sending out his eye in search of them. Here we have that eye again. <laughs> it brings back these ideas together in a more informative, if occasionally mystifying narrative. The account is rendered as a speech of Neverger, who is made to say, here he goes. Heaven or the sky had not been created. The earth had not been created. The children of earth and reptiles had not been fashioned in that place. I raised them up from Nunu. None, nothing, right? From a state of helpless inertness. I found no place there whereon I could stand. I formed a spell in my heart. I laid down a foundation by Ma'at. I made forms of every kind. I was one by myself, for I had not then evacuated under the form of Shu. I had not then passed water under the form of Tefnu. There existed no other who worked with me. I laid a foundation in my own heart or mind. Many creations of creations came into being from the creations of the offspring, from the creations of their children. I thrust my phallus into my closed hand. I made my seed to enter my hand. I poured it onto my, the hand, by the way, is Hathor. Mm -hmm. I poured it into my own mouth. I evacuated under the form of Shu. I passed water under the form of Tefnu. This, this is, again, it's, it's a confirmation that everything returns to silence and is born from silence. Every end is a new beginning. Can't be any other way. Well, I mean, he sounds ultimately like complete unity consciousness, zero point. That's exactly right. And we reach him when we come back to center, when the jet pillar is raised. We then point to our ecliptic pole. Earth is now in balance. And then it falls again. And it can fall in either direction. And it's consciousness. It's it's <laughs> right there, again, there's a there's a decision there in that unity consciousness to begin again yes that's and, ta what and take the first steps exactly we have choice as, as weird as they describe it <laughs> it's well i've been saying for decades that our most important choice that we'll ever make is the choice we make upon the moment we leave the physical reality i didn't even want to say the word death but the moment we leave this physical reality, what do we choose to do next? Um, and this is why they wrote these books of the dead, why we have the Tibetan book of the dead, because they're telling us what we will face, what we will come to be. And what we're facing is in, we are dead. <laughs> we are dead now, but we're alive. You see what I mean? The duality is the night cycle. We need to wake up to the day cycle. Um, and maybe we can choose to keep coming back tonight until we get it right. Um, you know, nothing, nothing again we think is real really is. It's all an illusion. We create the game boards. So what do you want to do next? 
And of course, the game board, you can see Beth standing on in uh, around his feet. We see Draco again, mm -hmm. and he's riding the two serpents. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So here we have our two serpents again. Neck bet and watch it. Just to give him a name. <laughs> the two ladies. See, the serpents have to be feminine. The currents are always feminine. Currency itself, pulsing alive currency is feminine. It's it, 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 the basically the the you mean the magnetism side of electromagnetism? Exactly. It's always feminine. That's why the grid lines, you know, it, 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 it's always a feminine understanding because it can be, you know, the grid lines, magnetic energy, electromagnetic energy can be nurturing or it can like a mother or it mm -hmm. can be <laughs> it can be raging like a Sekhmet mm -hmm. who is also a mother and she's raging to protect her own. And, and this is the energy of the divine feminine. You know, it, it, it's it's either Lakshmi or, or Kali or, you know, Sekhmet or Hathor. Um, this is that energy. Can have a bite. So here is an interesting image. We've, we've seen many images of Horus killing the beast. This is said to be Set killing the beast. Um, it's not the only image I've seen. And again, you know, he is up there in that circumpolar spin. He, 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 from that story, right, you know, he becomes the big dipper, the little dipper, you know, running around in, 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 in the spin of Draco, stuck, confined in the cycles and cycles within cycles of uh, 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 material reality. And he also can be the one that kills the chaos to bring us back to silence for his own release from, <laughs> from the spin, you know, to bring things back to, you know, zero point silence. Mm. But never dare continues. <laughs> they brought to me my eye. Hmm. <laughs> Is that the cat's eye nebula? <laughs> Following on after these things, I united or gathered together my generative members and I shed tears over them. And men and women straightway came into being from the teardrops which came forth from my eye. The text mentions a second eye, the moon, <laughs> which God, the God seems to have produced from his first eye. That is to say the sun. On the first eye, the sun, he bestowed the uraeus of fire. And this eye was wrought when it was discovered that there was a second eye in the face of God, the moisture and heat, which were produced by Tefnu and Shu respectively, and the water of, of Rem, the greater eye of God, caused herbs, plants, trees, and creeping things to come into being. And under the influence of the moon, they flourished and multiplied exceedingly. The moon took up its place in the face of the God, and it ruleth the whole world. Shu and his female counterpart, Tefnut, produced Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. And Geb and Nut produced Osiris and Isis, Set and Neptus, and the eyeless Horus. Um, and so here you have, you know, when the last five are created, that's when we thoroughly fall into that 23.5 degree out of balance, um, mm -hmm. away from the perfect 360 day year into what we know of today as this 365, um, give or take a half day or whatever. Yeah, another um, quarter. Exactly. <laughs> um, year that we've come to know. And it's... it's Which also creates our seasons and different climates on Earth. Well, it, and this is the whole thing of the moon. Without the moon, without duality, we wouldn't have four seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a whole explanation of how we come from the one um, through one architect, one divine architect who imagines us into existence, basically. Uh, we are made in his image, right? The image of God. But what they're really showing us is this is all happening energetically. Um, and it's electromagnetic. So this was the beginning, and right now we are separated into as individual aspects as we can get before we reach the point where it 
pulls back in. Well, exactly. You heard him say, you know, I beget blah, 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 and their children beget blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you get to, so there's so many netters. We're all netters, right? Mm -hmm. All of us <laughs> are aspects of nature. Um, <laughs> they forgot to tell us that when we were born, right? Um, <laughs> we're all we're all divine aspects. We all have this God energy within us because we're all part of the breath. Um, and and uh, somehow that understanding gets lost over time, and we're told we have to look outside ourselves to a divine energy. But that we we the truth is we need to look within and not without. Um, it's always been within us. And here, I love this image. You can see there's the two um, wadgets, wadget net bed on top of Bess's two-faced head. Some people use this two-faced. Some of the cultures have used this double face to represent the new year. You know, we, we've seen this image. In oh, the like year. Janus. <laughs> January, exactly. month of the, which gives us the month January, of course. Exactly. Um, but here you can see um, it all comes from this, right? He was Santa Claus. <laughs> but in, and he has a beautiful white beard here, too. But you can see he's breathing out the breath of duality. One figure, two directions. Yeah, naughty and nice. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. Perfect. <laughs> And here you have this beautiful image of Tefnut with the dual opposing wave spin, and she represents the earth currents. Um, I see this as the ancient magnetic equator, that image on the left. And I did put the red and white crown on it. <laughs> um, Which we've said before, the Sphinx is a representation of Tefnut on the yeah. ancient magnetic equator at Zeptepi. Exactly. Um, the mansion of Heka, magic was associated with Heliopolis, and Heko is given special veneration in the Memphite necropolis, appearing on the Sphinx Stella of Tutmos IV, as, which is right between the paws of the Sphinx, mm -hmm. um, as the elder magician of the sacred place of primordial beginning, Zeptepi, as Alan just did. Um, this is this is what I'm talking about, folks. The dream uh, Stella. Oh, that's funny that we were talking about <laughs> intensified dreams, you know, connected yeah, to... Right. <laughs> connected to the uh, uh, yep. the magnetism of the earth. Huh. And it's funny because remember I pointed out that Tutmos says he fell asleep at noon. noon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, but again, here you see, you know, the ochre that represents um, yesterday and tomorrow. And you see the horizon, the symbol of the ochre on their backs. And you also see the serpent that uh, Ra Harakvi is riding. You know, and Ra Harakvi being um, the netter of the two horizons, Ra of the two horizons. Um, <laughs> again, interesting. Um, some people believe that means he can rise in the west or, and in the east, or it means uh, sunrise and sunset. But again, it, it can, <laughs> as we've talked about, go either direction. Um, and then you see the serpent, the cobra, um, with both crowns. Mm -hmm. Or is it just, you know, an optical illusion of both of them being there, both watch it and neck it. Um, but underneath this ocket, you see the symbol for un. And un is the beginning. It's noon. It's that moment of silence. And everything comes out from there to create the fabric of our reality. Well, and those three hieroglyphs together form the word eternity. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, it's H. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> each one of them is H in the center. Yeah. So, yeah, it's time. Cyclical time. It's happening all over again. So in the second version of the story of creation, the god Kepri is made to say, I fashion myself. See, it can be Kepri. It can be mm -hmm. a boom. It can be, you know... It's always the same story, different gnomes, different districts would tell, you know, use different titles and netters, but, you know, all the netters come from one, one source, and they breathe out into all these, you know, all these individual aspects. So that's why they can take different roles. Um, and, and I've said before, a netter is never stuck in a box like we, we put ourselves. 
you know, I, I've always said I'm so much more than Patricia, but Patricia, the label sticks me in a box. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we, we want to do when we look at some of the, the, the symbolism. But this symbolism migrates over time and space, depending on, you know, where you are on the planet, what angle of the sun is hitting it. And as well, um, through time and through, you know, our different levels of consciousness and also because they're archetypal energies. So, you know, Horus can be Mars in one minute. You know, he can be Saturn in one minute. He can be the sun, the ascended Osiris. He is all those things because he represents an archetypal energy. Um, and so we need to open our minds and not get stuck. And how can how can Horus be Saturn if he's... <laughs> So right. he's all on set. We've seen the figure where there's, you know, there's one figure and set and Horace looking two different directions. He's mm -hmm. sunrise and sunset. So Horace and set, I said, they both killed the beast. You know, it depends which direction you're going. Set kills the beast for one cycle and Horace kills the beast for the other. Yeah, just like so. the Buddha statue, the Buddha statue that you just showed. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and so he says, in the second version of the story of creation, the god Kepri is made in to say, I fashion myself out of the pot. And this is said to be the divine plasma, electromagnetic dust, right? Plasma of which the gods were made, or protoplasm. And my name is Osars. And they go on to say that it's possible Osars could be Osiris. Well, of course it is. He was called Osar with Seer. Um, and so in another interesting variant, Kepri says, I made my creations therein, no, no, by that soul, which I raised up therein out of inactivity. So it all comes as pot. It comes as plasma, electric. This is an electric universe. It's electromagnetic. And we're going to talk a lot about dust later. <laughs> So now I want to talk a little bit about Doug Vogt, who, um, as they would say in Egypt, God bless his soul, just passed. Um, but he left a legacy of knowledge. Um, and this comes, he, he, he created the Die Hold Foundation. If you want to look up his information, he speaks about, he spoke about, he, he looks at the sun and earth currents and catastrophe, but he also sees everything the way that Alan and I have been speaking about it in that the, you know, the earth will, you will have that moment of silence. The magnetics will flip in cyclical format every 12,000 years. And he agrees that everything will reverse the spin. And he goes on to explain it. So, you know, in this, we're, he's just explaining the Coriola effect or force. We've talked about this before, we, you know, that whirlpool effect. Um, and it acts in a direction perpendicular to the rotation axis and to the velocity of the body in the rotating frame and is proportional to the object's speed in the rotating frame. The horizontal deflection effect is greater near the poles, since poles, north and south pole, since the effective rotation rate about a local vertical axis is largest there and decreases to zero at the equator. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, on the equator, the water goes straight down the drain. Exactly, which it, again, it doesn't you know, swirl either direction. Exactly. That's that place when everything's in balance, when, you know, our, our magnetic equator is the path of the sun on the ecliptic. It's just, you know, beautiful. Um, the Coriolis force exists only when one uses a rotating reference frame. So we only have this because the earth is rotating. Um, you know, I went to the equator in Ecuador and I balanced an egg on a nail. <laughs> oh, Mitad del mundo, the middle of the world. You're you're able to do that, and they give you a little certificate when you leave <laughs> if oh, you can do. It. I take pictures. That's so cool. <laughs> How awesome! So he goes on to say the phys physics behind the Earth rotation. Their paper concludes by stating that the Schrodinger equation for a reduced system and the Pauli. I know this sounds technical, but equation have opposite have opposite sign one is attractive and the other repulsive that means opposite spin <laughs> another example of opposite spin and direction so he's trying to show us how this occurs 
Um, and again, look him up. He has lots of information, lots of videos, um, and, and it really is fantastic information. Um, and here he shows it in a really beautiful way. Uh, <laughs> I call this upside down and backwards because we want to go upside, we want to go back to the right side up and forward, right? Because mm. that would be right direction, well, <laughs> that would be right brained. That's what I'm getting to. Turn so, over and rise. <laughs> exactly. So in the top, if you're looking at that torus field motion, he's showing the spinning particle with both longitudinal and transverse components of spin. He calls this the right-handed spin, but he says rotations leave handedness. So he's calling it instead of right ascension, left ascension, he's calling it right handedness versus left handedness. And we've talked a little bit about that too. So he says rotations leave handedness of particles alone. So as it's rotating, if you look at his images, the right hand side eventually becomes the left hand side as there's a reversal of magnetics. Again, it's perception. It's the magnetic field that's reversing everything. Our Everything will still look the same to us, but our consciousness will be reversed and we'll begin to rise into unity consciousness. We've already gone down the other direction. Now, it, like I said, I've always said a thousand times at least, this is a journey of perception, not the physical, not you know the material earth, but what's happening to us on a left, uh, yeah, consciousness is in the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. So I'll talk more about this. I have some wonderful things coming ahead, but this is to get us in that right direction or left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he says um, the Dial Health Foundation um, is a 501, whatever that means, science, science foundation. But mm -hmm. the next day, our research is collecting samples of the glass beads that came from the sun from around the world. There should be a pattern to the quantity of glass beads in the sediments above the previous geomagnetic reversals in relation, relation to their position on the earth. The time the dust shell hit the earth, that's the dust I've been talking about, in the galactic field that breathes out, exhales, and inhales every 12,000 years. You're not talking about a solar ejection. You're talking about dust Galactic. particles coming from... Center of the galaxy. Right. This dust is in so many stories and so much, and I'm gonna go into detail about it. This dust is magic dust. <laughs> but anyway, this dust is what will eventually enlighten us. It, it's electromagnetic, it's plasma. Um, but anyway, the time the dust shall hit the earth, 12,000 years ago. This would enable man to know what side of the earth will be facing the sun when it novas. And oh. we've talked about micronova and what side of the earth will get hit with the dust shell 17 to 18 hours later. This information will tell us what kind of shelter should be built and where people can, can actually be during the reversal. He's uh, suggesting that we'll be able to know which side of the earth is facing Exactly. Now, Ben Davidson, I've heard him say that they've actually looked um, and, and he entertains the idea of reversal of direction, but he I, I don't think he has consciously actually gone there with it. Mm. He, he talks about it. He loves he loves the work of Doug Bogue, um and, and paid him great tribute when he passed. Excuse me, but he's not so sure about reversal or how it works. But again, like I said, it's in magnetic, it's in consciousness itself. Um, it's not necessarily that the earth, it, it's a change in the earth. It's, it's a change in the magnetic grid lines. Um, so anyway, try and wrap your heads around that. We'll, we'll go into that more, I promise. Um, the um, but what I'm saying is they, they both. Oh, yeah. What I was going to say is Ben um, has mentioned that they've also done a study of the last like seven times this magnetic reversal happened every 12,000 years. And they have seen a pattern and they do know where it's going to hit. So it's um, always hitting the same side or there's no, a pattern to which side it's it almost is. like going through the chakras of the earth in a way he said oh that, like th this time it'll hit this third and then the next time it'll be the next third and the next time it'll be the next third yeah um 
So yeah, we'll we'll talk about this more, but mm -hmm. they're both saying that, you know, this is something that, you know, I'm not gonna say is absolutely imminent, but I am gonna say this is this is imminent. <laughs> You know, you, you can choose to believe what you want, but do do the homework and choose for yourself how you see things happening. Mm. Um, but our magnetic field is weakening. Um, and again, why Alan and I want to project all of this knowledge in this moment in time is how we walk this journey is makes a difference. How we go through these moments in time makes a difference in how we experience it. Um, so <laughs> stay with us, if, if you dare. Um, I, I, I'm presenting this now because it also, one of the key things that I want to portray is that this ancient symbolism story, mythology, dogma, holds within it so much knowledge. And here I'm talking about the biblical story of Sarah and Ibrahim. Um, and, you know, this is Old Testament story, and this all occurs in Egypt. And Sarah was Sarah, <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> who was also ninth, because it, it is the, the, the Sa is the fluid life force of the universe. Um, so as the fluid life force, you know, it, it, it's, that breath, she, she is the breath of the great central sun. But Ibrahim, <laughs> Ibra, as we've said before, um, is a beam from the heart of the sun. It's what the obelisk represents, right? And Ibrahim is the one who is a beam from the heart of the sun. You know, this is huge. So together, Sarah and Ibrahim give birth to or provide the life force of the beam from the heart of the great central sun. Um, they are the original father and mother, if that makes sense. Um, Ibrahim is an Arabic form of Abraham, which is from the Hebrew Aveman, Ave Aman, <laughs> meaning father of many. Um, Imhotep, of course, meant uh, he who comes in peace, the one who comes in peace. So, um, you know, it, it, it's basically saying, you know, this is this is mom and pop, right? <laughs> um, which is they were the mother and father of, of Jacob. And uh, you can take that on to the 12 tribes of Israel. So. Mm. Just food for thought. I'm not saying that they didn't exist as people, but portrayed within patterns of knowing if that, you know, if, if, if you could allow that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so here we see, again, the unification of the two waters, water being energy in motion, also representing the dual opposing waveform. And you can see the waters are coming from jars that are being offered by Horus and Toth, and they're coming in two different directions. This is known again as the purification ceremony. And this is actually at um, one, of the, one of the buildings, one of the temples um, or chambers at Karnak. And the image that's been scratched out is Hatshepsut. Um, and so this would have been part of a hepset ritual or a ritual purification as she's going through the ritualistic, um, basically the labyrinth back to center uh, through a ceremony and ritual in which she becomes with all, you know, the power that is the, you know, the, the, the all, the one, the he, she, the great he, she, and everything feels she's everything or he in the universe and brings that power back down to earth, that, that feeling, that knowing, that gnosis, and then gets crowned as a Horus king, um, as an ascended form of Osiris representing the underworld, Horus representing the uh, unity consciousness. Um, and that's why the, these pharaohs, kings, had the right to rule. This is why they're placed on a throne, sitting in their power, mm -hmm. and crowned with the dual crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, the two ladies. Um, and here you see the Hotep, 
this is uh, an image of the Hotep, and you see the, there's your two jars and the two waters going into what? The erect lotus or papyrus pillar representing that moment of oneness. Um, so it's actually illustrating this. And the Hotep itself means food or peace. <laughs> peace is what I'm getting at. Hotep, again, is, is spelled with, with symbols representing HTP, and you reverse HTP, you get PTH, which are the symbols for Pata. Pata was coming into form, Hotep is returning to um, the formless. Oh, so these offering tables are like a device to transmute the energy back to the non-physical. Exactly. But for what You know, by the way, <laughs> That's the same understanding of the Meru, um, you know, the, the Yani Lingam oh. that you have in India. It, uh -huh. it is also shaped like this with the waters at the bottom of the Lingam. And it's that same ancient knowing of this process of moving between form and formless. Wow. Yeah. And it's interesting that the two waters are streams of Ankhs. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you'll see a waset in between, and waset again being spirit, oh. being placed in form. Mm -hmm. um, the sword and, and the waset. stone. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and they call it uh, power and dominion, but it's really, <laughs> you know, the sword, it, it, it's spirit being placed in form, which gives power to the form, but it also takes away the, the, that formlessness. Mm -hmm. um, just fascinating. <laughs> anyway, so I found these images and I had to share because we, we keep talking about when these patterns, you know, come into play. And I saw this image and it comes from a chart of signs of the zodiac from 1485 to 1525 AD. So, yeah, several hundred years ago. Um, what's interesting, and I have the image of the whole picture on the far right, but I wanted to show you a close-up on the left. If you look at the top, we have Venus facing one direction and a priest facing the other direction. Um, and you can see that he's holding a staff that gives you that 23.5 degree angle. <laughs> uh, but we have our masculine and feminine spins. You have this wonderful bird. It, it, you know, it could be, it's hard to say what it is. It could have a crest. It could be a peacock. I don't think so. But the bird is always on top. That's that's center. Horus is always on the pole, right? Right. This is Horus on the papyrus pillar. Exactly, exactly. But what I found phenomenal is you see this breath coming from the bottom of this zodiac. Um, and within it, you see the sun and the moon merging, mm -hmm. right? And we, we've shown you this image, and, I, and I'll show it again in another format. But the breath is emerging in between Capricorn and, and Aquarius. And Saturn rules both Capricorn and Aquarius. So this is the same dynamic I've already shown you. I didn't hadn't seen this before. But here it is. It's actually been documented. They're showing that this is the portal. You either go from Capricorn to Cancer, Silver mm -hmm. Gate, right? Because Cancer um, is ruled by the moon, which it, it rules Silver. Or you go the Aquarius Leo, Golden Gate, Leo being, you know, being ruled by the sun, which rules gold. It's Silver and Gold coming together as as that moment of silence before we breathe in another direction um and it's dual opposing directions with venus facing one way and the masculine facing the other so again i you know this is this has been documented it's not just me doesn't mean it's happening but it's it's everywhere <laughs> the center is the ecliptic pole and um it represents, you know, Fucus and Taurus are the two uh, moments. Taurus, when we fall into form, and a Fucus at, at, at in between Scorpio and Sagittarius is the pathway to the center of the galaxy, and that's when we cross over completely from, you know, um, 
this moment when we're sort of shape-shifting out of form and in that moment at a fugus we fought we, we become the formless again mm. the currency the opposite so, of taurus when we fall into form exactly and that's when we we have this total unity consciousness we are the serpents right <laughs> of the you know we we feel it we can we can manifest however we want but we we know and and even when i say we are the serpents it can be just consciously we feel it all we know it all um and and the ancients speak about a time when we were this and you know that that mankind lived forever and, and chose when they wanted to cross over um so <laughs> again just food for thought so here it is as I've shown it before, and it's the same dynamic. Um, Turning lead into gold. <laughs> Turn lead into gold. Well, there you have it. I'm not the only one who saw it this way. And just a little aside, it's interesting for us that, you know, it's kind of depicting this solar eclipse we know is coming up in 2027 in, <laughs> e in Egypt. We know where we're going to be. Is going to have an ins <laughs> insane length of totality seven minutes or something seven minutes and it and, will appear in totality at yeah the temple of Hathor at, at dendera and at luxor yeah and it's july august 2nd so august. It's in, in leo it's in leo and it's going to happen at noon there is just so many strange dynamics um including that intense experience i had which i'm not going to talk about now but so, so many things, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. But also, if you look within on the far right, if you look within the center on either side of the sun and the moon um, and the center of the, uh, the whole diagram, you'll see two images of Draco facing each other, spinning in dual opposing directions. Bingo. <laughs> it can't be any other way. <laughs> it can't be any other way. Uh, <laughs> Really, it can't. <laughs> it's right there. And we see this all the time, that same image of two Dracos meeting <laughs> together, right? Um, it's no accident. This is an ancient knowing that's been drilled out of us. We've, we've allowed ourselves to forget, um, but I, I don't really blame us because it's, it, it, we've been taught something totally different. Um, and that's why, you know, I am so passionate about studying, going as far back as possible and carrying it forward to see, you know, what the ancients actually were projecting. Um, and sometimes you have to use your own intuition, you know, follow your gut, use your heart, go within and allow the patterns to emerge to actually see them. Because if I went to the books that are written today, I wouldn't find this stuff. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of this journey, um, as we perceive it in the heavens, here we have Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth. You know, it's basically the seven classical planets, and our journey goes back and forth. The ones this visible is, from the naked for the from the naked eye. Exactly, and so we also see our separation of all these archetypal energies. These seven um, we've talked about, you know, the seven Hattors, the seven. Uh, pole stars, the seven, it, it's this archetypal patterning of separation and then coming back mm. to center. It's, it's a dance between set and the sun <laughs> and the reflected light of the sun on the moon, um, day and night cycles. When the full moon resides in Aquarius, the sun will be in Leo. The sun, whoops, is be in Leo. The sun will be in Leo. <laughs> it's always in your opposite sign. Like, you know, when I was born, I was born on a full moon and um, it was a full moon in Taurus because I was born in, as my, with my son in Scorpio. Um, if I had been born as a Leo and under a full moon, were you born in a full moon? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, uh, it was a full moon in Aquarius. Right. So and an eclipse. Was, exactly. <laughs> so I go on to say we are approaching the full moon and winter solstice pause within the great year which is the portal between day and night cycles. It, it, it is that simple. Um, you know, when the sun is in, in Leo in the northern hemisphere, it also goes to, to uh, be that the, um, 
the sun will be in Aquarius on this southern hemisphere. And right now we're entering um, the age of Aquarius. And if we were to flip our magnetics, the sun would be in Leo. Mm. And this is another wonderful image that shows just this. There's the sun shining on Leo and the moon is shining on the opposite side of the, um, the uh, zodiac panel and uh, it's showing the moon and there is Sophia <laughs> or Sirius looking up at the whole process. And it's showing you the division between day and night. I love this too. I found this beautiful painting um, and you see, look where Christ Jesus is sitting right between Pisces entering Aquarius. That's the golden gate. Yeah. <laughs> That's where he's sitting. That's where he rises, right? He is said to be the fish, but when he resurrects, it will be in Aquarius through the golden gate. Yeah. Christ um, consciousness returning. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Um, without a doubt. Um, and here we have this image of Horus uh, facing the other direction. And you're, he's looking at the baboon um, with holding the left eye. Um, and of course, this represents the awakening of consciousness. It can, we can spin either way. This is the key. Um, and here is the Yuga cycle, an image of the Yuga cycles. And Kali is down with Saturn. And of course, Satya is up at the top where we come out um, in a different cycle. The thing is, this would be for the descending, but when we ascend, there is that reversal and then the arrows go the other direction. In other words, this, this becomes Kali moving into Satya. It's just the diagram only covers half the process, but they do have the 12,000 year cycle. Um, they just don't have the figure eight. And again, this is all interpretation from very ancient texts and not understanding or even being able to envision that process makes it hard to, 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 to illustrate it perfectly. So much knowledge has been lost, but we do find, and, and, and we've talked about this in other presentations, in ancient dogma, in the Bible, in the Quran, in so many ancient cultures, they talk about the, the reversal and the sun rising in the West. Um, it's a journey of consciousness. And again, you know, I'm showing you the directions. It's a journey of consciousness. They say it over and over and over again. It's not a journey of physicality. It's a journey of conscious awareness. Um, here we see the two waters again, purification ceremony in the upper right hand um, picture. And underneath we see the coronation um, of the king getting the two crowns, the unity consciousness um, from, from this moment of the release of the two waters, the purification ceremony. And on the left, oh, what do we have? There's It's happy. <laughs> and with Wajit and Nekbed on top, right? Yeah. He's in and his little cave. <laughs> in the cave, releasing the two waters of the great flood, right? In this case, the annual flood, but Hopi represented Aquarius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, was, there was no great flood <laughs> in Aquarius. <laughs> so what are we looking at? Are we looking at uh, uh, the, the dynamic of what's happening today? The great year um, flood. Exactly, exactly. Um, truly and fascinating. water, not being water, but as it's represented as anks, life force. Well, and life force being released from a container. Mm. So many different ways to look at it. Will there be another great flood? Quite possibly. Will it affect us? It all depends. You know, if you believe you're your body or you, <laughs> you know that you're not, that that's, that's the difference. Um, and this is all happening underneath that symbol for pet, the heavens. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the top and there's the wasset of being placed in form on the far right, um, part of a container, <laughs> fascinating portrayal, but yeah, this is, you'll see this at filet, um, 
at Hadrian's Gate. It's really, really, truly fantastic. And it tells the story of what mythologies that were spoken of that happened on Elephantine and or Bigga, the island that Hadrian's Gate faces. Um, and of course, Hoppy being in the cave, surrounded by Draco or, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, a, a, it's basically the cave perception of reality. And this is the release into a day cycle. And then we have creation again. And I just wanted to show you at the top of this creation scene, again, with the purification of the two waters, um, which is holding within it the two Feminine netters are pouring this water. Um, and within that, you see the Ogdod, the eight creator gods of the entire universe with the mares in their hand, creating, you know, the pathways for the energy in motion to flow, liquid light becoming form. Um, and it's happening at the moment of there is the erect jet pillar on top of the lower register. Um, with the figure of Anubis, it's actually Whippawat, uh, in my opinion, it could be Anubis, but the path opener mm -hmm. from the moment of the resurrection of Osiris, that is the fetish of Osiris's head, representing Osiris's head when the Jed Pillar is restored, resurrected, moment of silence, and then we begin again. Can't be any other way. And I found this fascinating, and I've read this before, I've read it in books, um, but the diagram on the left is, is trying to show you how this energy spirals in and out in two different directions. They talk, they, they call it the hours of the Amduat, um, and uh, these operating instructions that are given to us in the, the hours of the Amduat, so to speak, do not describe a linear course around the walls of the burial chamber. The book begins with the setting sun's entry into the western gate of the horizon, first hour, reaches its midpoint at the abyss, the deepest point, right, where we're at now, of the underworld, which is the sixth hour, this is important, and ends up with the rising sun's elevation from the eastern horizon of the sky at the 12th hour. These facts demand that we view the underworld in vertical terms of descent and ascent, two different directions, in addition to the horizontal terms involved in spiraling around the cardinal directions, constantly changing direction. But it's, you know, in the image, you're looking at a 2D image trying to explain spiraling in and out. And that's where your change of direction comes. But you see where I'm getting at. This is this is an electromagnetic spiraling energy in and out. And it it includes, it has to include a change of direction when you have the ascension and descension. So we've seen this before, but again, this is the right place to see it again. Um, and it's called the Vignette of Ra, uh, also known as the Roads of Mahan. Um, and it's from the Middle Kingdom. Uh, it's a Middle Kingdom painting, one of its kind painted onto the headboard of the coffin of General Zephi, um, buried at Dar al Sheet near the city of Toth in Hermopolis, Middle Egypt. Um, but what's fascinating, it also describes the same reversal of spin. Um, and so what you're looking at, again, is this moving around an image in the center. Um, but, you know, one is called, you know, they're calling it the paths of fire. So again, electromagnetism. Um, and they guard, um, one guards the starboard side of the bark and one, you know, it, it, it's basically the bark of Ra traveling um, on its path. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but in two, on both sides, both paths, it has these two different phrases, which the one on the one side, it says the gates are confused. The bow of the bark of the coiled one has swung around. And on the other side, we have a similar thing where it says the gates are confused. The starboard side of the bark belongs to the right side of the coiled one. So again, it, it's there, it's saying it, why it's there. Um, I, if you look at his crown, you can see there's a serpent underneath 
right above the horns, and it's showing the serpent going both directions. Um, and again, is that serpent Draco? Is, you know, it, oh, of course, they're saying exactly what I've been saying. Um, wow, that's really so, fascinating. <laughs> isn't it? That's why it has to be shown again, you know, it, because our minds in a left brain consciousness, we so easily forget these things and we always go back to, well, how can that happen? Everything would die. <laughs> <laughs> But it happens, and it happens as a journey of perception, which is electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, you know, we think that everything in form is real. It's an illusion. It is real to us. It's liquid light showing itself as form to us. And that form doesn't have to change. That's the funny thing. It's just our perception of it changes. We move from right brain to left brain. And what a wonderful way to illustrate that in mythology and in, in picture and form um, and even within the temples themselves. Um, and this is uh, the famous Book of Two Ways. We've talked about it before. This is a better image that I showed the last time. Um, it's an intricate map of the ancient Egyptian underworld, you know, the night cycle. Um, but it's also the day cycle because this is, you know, it, it's sort of showing us both in a way. And if you look at the two images I have circled in blue, you have two birds coming together into union in on, on the right hand side, which is the, the left hand side of the box. And then on the uh, in on right to the, the to the left of that, you see the two images. There's a figure standing, but the, what he's standing on, you have two faces go moving out. So that the direction of moving out and the direction of moving in, the two sides, um, you know, the two different directions of, of uh, spin. Um, and uh, they say one by land and one by sea. And it reminded me of a song <laughs> from Scotland, you know, oh, you take the high road. And I'm not going to sing it and I'll take the road. <laughs> and I'll be in Scotland before you. Um, and they talk about, you know, one being dead and moving in spirit and one being alive and, you know, how spirit moves faster. It, it, it's, it's a similar understanding, tone and story format, but fascinating, one being form and one being spirit. Um, two different ways to travel. Um, in a, in, a, in a world or a perception of reality that is alive um, in movement. Um, and this, this, this coffin is at least 4,000 years old. Um, and somehow this knowledge is lost over time. Here you can see them closer up, those two images. Um, separation consciousness, left brain consciousness moving away. Um, from each other and then the two that are coming back together and notice that these are swallows because I'm going to talk about them and here again we have two angels coming together at the erect pillar um, <laughs> and it, it, it looks like it's a woman that is erecting the pillar just like Isis mm. um, restoring um, the pillar the jet of Osiris um, and it's so, the center of a Taurus field with the shape of it. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's the rabbit hole. It's the portal. Um, yeah. From Walter Russell, the beauty of a piece of music is not in its technique, but in the soul of its creator. Um, nor is it in the sound vibrations of the piece, but in the silence of the light from which the sound springs. Um, that's where, how it all happens. It comes from our center. And again, there's the beautiful diagrams that show us how this works. Um, you know, the construction of one cycle of an electric current um, and the potentials that, that move in and out, electric potential divides. Um, and this is an Einstein equation that shows then how it reverses. Um, it's the mind and motion of the universe. So it's, it's within all the patterns of life. And there's your seven, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it, seven different, you know, it divides out into these seven tones, seven colors. These are the seven highest qualities that um, Ibrahim Karim speaks about in, in um, 
as you know what we you know every every string every path that has an end and a beginning has those seven levels in between um and then you cut the string in half and you have the seven again and you cut it again and you have the seven again can't be any other way these are the patterns of nature um, but unification brings us back to center um, and there's an image of the simi sima the, the center of the sima tawi which is all about the unification of the, the you know the lotus and the papyrus the two the two breaths um, the two dual opposing breaths um, and I just love this image, a very old statue of the masculine and the feminine forming the um, infinity symbol mm -hmm. uh, and creating the portal. Um, and this just always blows me away. I might have shown this in a previous presentation, um, but I took this picture when I had an opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies at Hatshepsut's temple. They opened it briefly and then uh, closed it back up again. You can only kind of peek in. <laughs> Um, and uh, I saw this image of, uh, it, it almost looks like a stargate, right, um, over the Sima Tawi. And so we're looking at the breath of life, and the figure to the left is using the Sima, right, as a key, <laughs> right? It's the key to unity consciousness, this breath of life, knowing how to to breathe the great yogic breath in and out is the key to finding unification, unity consciousness. At the very top, we see the sun disk with the wings down, the moment of silence, complete gnosis. And of course, this would occur inside the Holy of Holies, where it is aligned with the rising sun on the solstice, right? Yeah. The winter solstice, a moment of silence. Um, everything is nothing with a twist. Yep. We have to spiral up and down to find our center. Unification is the key to opening the portals of higher dimensions. Reach for the stars and learn how to find them. Alchemy, alchemet, alchemy, it all came from Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you look at this picture defining out, it's, you know, it's, it's a picture of the Ouroboros from the alchemical treatise Aurora, Consurgens from the 15th century again in Zurich, Switzerland. But look what we have, Draco, and he's got his back on the the, the, the fire, right? The the um, lake of fire that we see in ancient Egypt, uh, <laughs> and on top again we see our birds, um, and it's it's basically our day and night cycles. Hell is 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 now. We're living <laughs> in the duat. We're mm. we are in hell. <laughs> rising into spirit um and it's all with the spin of draco um and the island of flames where the deceased must pass is is the purification by fire we do this to obtain eternal life it's yes. again the, the, <laughs> the churning of the milk to get the elixir of immortality you it's, said that so quickly i think it's worth saying again this is the night cycle we're in the night cycle. Our, our re we're not in the day cycle, even though it looks like daytime outside. Yep. In in the great year of our consciousness <laughs> rising and falling, we are actually in the night cycle. We're in the duat. Exactly. So you're exactly. saying when we get to the lowest point, six o'clock <laughs> is when we turn right. over, over and rise and begin the ascent back to exactly. sunrise. The yeah. Book of the Dead was actually the book of coming forward by day. It's not right? about the dead at all. It's about... <laughs> <laughs> they change the name. They make us think it's all about death. It's yeah. not. It's about us, right? Tell and, and we keep telling each other we need to wake up, right, from our deep sleep. Well, we have been asleep. We think this world is real, but it's just a dream. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the original people of Australia have told us this for year, for years. We are in the, the dream world. We're um, watching the images on the, the, the shadows on Plato's and, cave. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How many times can we say it? But, you know, I don't mind saying it over and over until we totally embrace it, because then we can move forward. Um, and I love that this is all about alchemy which was supposedly turning lead into gold, but this is what they're showing us, an image of Draco spinning in the heavens, our clock in the sky. Mm -hmm. This is about our movement through time and space. 
It's not about turning an actual element into another element, right? Chrysopoeia was turning lead into gold and Argyropoeia was turning a substance such as copper into silver. Mm -hmm. um, they're talking about what I was talking about. And the, the, the book of coming forth by day <laughs> tells us that the lake of fire is red colored and got red, right? So that's when the water leaves Egypt desert, desert red, <laughs> right? We are moving through the purification of fire. It's Which is also the, the bottom of the rainbow. Yes, exactly. And our lowest chakra, the root exactly, chakra. Exactly, right. So, you know, this is, this is the journey we're on. It's Kundalini rising. Um, so, yeah, fire is, is red colored and guarded by four baboons. The god Ra uses this lake to travel to different realms. It's a portal. Um, and we can use it as a portal. Uh, and it's Christianity and, and other, other dogma that turns it into a fiery hell. This is where the idea of a fiery hell comes from. But it's happening now. And we're not burning up, folks. We're not happy. We're a little anxious and frustrated. But we're not burning in hell. There is no judgment. Except self-judgment. Right, except what you put on yourself. Exactly. And all the secrets are hidden within the ancient symbolism and mythology. You know, and, and so many people have told us this, Manly P. Hall, you know, if you learn the secrets of the symbolism, you're totally going to get it, folks. Um, and that's what, you know, Alan and I are trying to do. We're not saying we're right, but we're doing our best to offer possibilities. Um, we think we're right, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, just, I, until, I, I will until, add that, Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, uh, well. We I was going to say, right. I'll add that just when I think I'm right, I find out, oops, there's something else. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, this is the best we have with the knowledge we have so far. If we get new knowledge that changes. We present immediately, yeah. Right. And that's what we're doing. You know, as things keep coming in, I keep adding more and more. Um, and that's why I love the podcast format, because, you know, it can change and morph and grow. And we're starting with the basics and we're moving into something so much bigger. Um, so, you know, I've shown this before, but again, it shows these two directions up and down in movement and, and the two 23.5 degree angles, one pointed up, one pointed down, um, because the magnetic field flips um, to create this reversal of spin, this perceived reversal of spin. Um, and of course, here we have our two, two cross keys again, the golden gate, the silver gate. Um, and here's St. Peter holding them. I, I probably showed this before, but the golden key up, the, the silver key down, um, you know, what more can I say? <laughs> it's so obvious. Um, and this crown, I like to come back to this because it's, it's worn in, in symbolism, you know, in so many different cultures, this triple crown, or sometimes it's, it's got four tiers, but this crown itself representing the fetish of Osiris in the moment of silence. Um, and here, you know, it represents, it had the symbolic meaning of dominion of the Una Sancta Ecclesia over the earth. You know, here's the Pope wearing it, right? Pope John the XXIII, um, and demonstrated the meaning of the Papal Unum Sanctum, which affirms the authority of the Pope as the heir of Peter. He holds the keys and vicar of Christ over all human authority, spiritual and temporal. Most of the surviving three crown popple tiaras have the shape of a circular beehive with its central core may have made of silver. Mm. Some were sharply conical and others bulbous. The three crowns are marked by the golden decorations, um, sometimes in the form of crosses and sometimes in the shape of leaves. So, yeah. You can see the sun on one of his gloves. There's probably a moon on the other, but I'm just guessing. <laughs> Just, I just find it all so fascinating that this threads of this ancient knowing still exist, but we've forgotten what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, 
So here we see that same crown and it is the head of Osiris as the erect jet pillar. And if you look in the red circle, what's fascinating, I want to point out too, that I'm showing you the, the cobras wearing the two crowns, right, together. And if you look, they're coming out of the circle around the top of his head. That's Draco. Hmm. <laughs> it gets more and more fascinating. And there are the two heads of Draco coming together. <laughs> See? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. Um, so this hand gesture with the, the pinky up and the thumb up, I, I had to do a lot of research. I've seen it in other places in Egypt. We actually saw Horus inside um, the, uh, I think it was the Shen. I know just, re you know, just within this presentation, he had the same uh, mudra. Um, but what I, well, all I could find, and if, if somebody knows something else, please comment on this. But I found that this hand gesture is made by holding, of course, the hand in a loose fist, extending the thumb and the pinky. Um, and it's used by surfers as a hang loose gesture. Um, and it's said to be a symbol of the aloha spirit, which is the connection of mind and spirit, which is exactly what we're talking about, bringing together the two hemispheres of the brain, right? Um, it also has roots in Buddhism. The gesture was not called shaka until the mid 1960s. According to former plantation workers in Hawaii, the word derives from Japan's shaka Buddha, whose hand gestures mudra meant fear not and acceptance and salvation. So again, no fear, back to the heart, acceptance, and of course, unity consciousness as salvation, the uh, resurrection of mankind. Um, just fascinating. Um, now now that's, that's, a, that's a different hand symbol to the, the devil horns that are popularized yeah. in Totally, totally, because that one is the pinky and the forefinger, mm. this one, but that one is the thumb and the pinky, so it's, it's, it is different, it's fascinating. Um, but yeah, so here we have on the left again, <laughs> we see the Tree of Life and Draco uh, with the two heads um, facing the opposite directions, one has wings, one doesn't. So it's that same alchemical understanding. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the one with the crown is in the day, and the one with the without the crown is moving through the earth in this picture underneath the tree. Um, day and night cycles. And this is called the Trishund Ganpati. It's from the good Trishund, sorry, Ganpati Temple, um, and. Um, it, it, it sort of looks like the Shiva Lingam, right? And you see it's this image that takes you up in a spiraling direction with the serpent with the five heads at the top, the Naga. Mm -hmm. um, but the story is fascinating. It's said to be a depiction of the Linga Baba story when Vishnu and Brahma contested for superiority. So they're competing with each other. And Shiva depicted here is the Linga. Although the story, he sometimes appears as a flame or pillar of light. Chal he challenged them to find his source, right? His heart, his center. So Vishna, Vishnu assumes the form of Varaha, the boar. And he goes down. See the boar on the, on the image? Mm -hmm. He's got his face down. So he looks down um, and he went searching for Shiva's feet at the bottom. Brahma assumed the form of Hamsa, the swan, Cygnus maybe, and flew high above looking for the head of Shiva, right? <laughs> Two different directions. Brahma and Vishnu both failed in their quest, of course. How do you find the center when you're going to the two separate, <laughs> separated consciousness, right? You're moving away from center. Um, both of them failed in their quest and returned to Lord Shiva as a linga. <laughs> Vishnu declared that he could not find the feet of Lord Shiva and regretted his arrogance. Brahma, however, claimed that he did not, that he did see the head of Lord Shiva. And as proof, he got a kataki flower, um, holy basil, known to us as holy basil, mm. and a cow as witnesses. <laughs> of course, he wasn't telling the truth. When Lord Shiva declared that's impossible to measure the limits of infinity, he cursed that Brahma would not have a temple on earth and that the Kataki flower in Tulsi would never be used for his worship. 
So fascinating, isn't it? Wow. Um, the image caught me because they're literally rising up and down the linga, which is this breath of life. Um, and they think they're going to find source by going one direction or the other when it always means, you know, we always need to go within to our center. This is the key. Um, and this is the key to understanding all the symbolism, both there and in Egypt. It's, it's, you know, we think we know what we're doing. We're going to go left brain. We're going to go right brain. And instead, we need to come back to center. And it's in all the symbolism of Egypt. Bring yourself back to center, back to source, back to the heart, the holy grail. Can't be any other way. We are slowed down. Sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned into the music of the cosmos. We are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments, and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. That's all it is. And that's from Albert Einstein. Interesting. And that is the end of part one. My gosh. <laughs> So yeah, we get we 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 start to have a little more fun and and even get into the some more temple depictions in uh, part two. Um, it's going to be really fascinating, really fascinating. Um, so yes, yeah, stay with us. Um, <laughs> I hope, hope you're enjoying this <laughs> as much as we are. And. Uh... We don't say it enough, but please leave your questions and comments, and we'll do our best to get back to you and answer those. Um, uh, our website is HorusRising.com, and uh, we will be back again very soon with more. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, thank you, Alan. <laughs>